Good morning. This is Tracy, right on Four Corners. Today, I'm talking to Riley Mitchell, paranormal investigator extraordinaire and the author of The Essential Paranormal Bucket List. Good morning, Riley. Morning, Tracy. How are you today? Oh, I'm doing great. How about yourself? I'm good. I'm a little spooky, though, after I finished reading your book. Oh, well, thanks. That's uh, that's high compliment. Uh, the idea, of course, is, is always to uh, leave your readers with a little bit of excitement. I'm interested in how you got involved. I, I looked at your website, and it looks like this isn't just a quick book you wrote, but you're really into this paranormal study thing, aren't you? Well, it's been something that um, even uh, even going back uh, as a kid, I was I was interested in. Um, I have a background in science, actually, uh-huh. and and so um, one of the things as a kid that was really fascinating to me was uh, sort of how things worked in the world, and um, I became very interested as a kid in um, in a lot of popular culture that dealt with uh, mysteries and. I, I don't know if you remember it. There was a TV show uh, that was in the 1970s called In Search Of, right? Which was which was a very popular syndicated TV show, and I remember being you know fascinated by that. Uh, the Twilight Zone, right. uh, from the 1960s, those kinds of shows um, really piqued an interest in me. That it was it was a combination of the uh, excitement of the unknown as well as uh, really some some great storytelling. Um, and those kind of things uh, have always been of interest to me. And so you compiled the Essential Paranormal Bucket List, 100 Mysterious mm-hmm. Things to Investigate Before You Die. Yes, it's, uh, it was a, quite an, an intensive uh, and somewhat uh, perilous attempt to reduce so many great opportunities, uh, not just here in the, in the Four Corners area here in the uh, southwest, but... Uh, throughout the country as well as internationally uh, to pare down the, the, the many possibilities for paranormal uh, travel and, and experiences uh, just to 100. I can imagine. Go all over the world in this book. You cover sites everywhere. Right. The idea, yeah, the idea was, to, um, was to, to focus mostly on the United States, but to have um, a number of sites that were just too good to, uh, to not include uh, internationally for some, uh, some more ambitious travelers and, and people that, uh, uh, that really wanted to, to experience some things, even, even uh, through uh, just doing some research uh, on those places uh, uh, from their, from their uh, more local kinds of uh, uh, Internet activities. So what made you put them in the order they are? Well, there's actually no uh, particular order to the way they're set up. Um, uh, I should probably say for for your listeners who may not necessarily know um, what paranormal means even, uh, paranormal uh, things are uh, activities, events, phenomena that are considered to be uh, beyond the accepted standards of scientific explanation. So... Um, and typically, those that that category or that larger category of, of things can be broken down into six subcategories of activities or types of phenomena, and they include um, uh, extraterrestrials and unidentified flying objects, or what we call UFOs, um, ghosts and spirits. Um, a third category is uh, mysterious geographic locations which would include things like the Bermuda Triangle or other kinds of uh, places that are based on, um, based on physical geography. Mm-hmm. Um, another category, a subcategory, is astrology and, and divination, so uh, fortune-telling, uh, psychic phenomena, those sorts of things. Uh, then we have magic and the occult. And last but not least, uh, subcategory number six is mythical creatures. So uh, Bigfoot, uh, the Loch Ness Monster, uh, things that are often called uh, uh, crypt- cryptids or cryptozoological um, animals. Right. And you have them all in here. Yes. I tried to pick um, a range of things from each of those subcategories to um, uh, to scatter throughout the book uh, to, to make it so that people can just kind of dip in here and there, um, have some things that may be somewhat local or somewhat in their region, uh, no matter where they are in the, in the country or even in the world, 
but then also some things that uh, they might want to see if they travel somewhere or they or they might uh, know someone who um, lives nearby some of these other places. So have you done all these? I have not. Um, I, I have a rule about doing a bucket list of anything, and that is that um, it's bad luck to actually do all the things on your bucket list because that means that you're kind of at the end of your um, uh, at the end of your time on Earth, and so it's better to uh, to have a few things at least that you haven't done. So, uh, in this case, I've I've done about um, maybe a third of these things. Oh, that's um, good. So, so there's a lot of there's a lot of time left for me to uh, experience more, and um, the more research I do, the more uh, things I think of that I'd like to try. Yes, you even have a list at the end that says, "Here's some things that didn't quite make it." So there's <laughs> there's a lot. Right, there are there are a lot, and and I think the other the other thing that I wanted to emphasize with this particular project is I think a lot of um, paranormal. Um, books and, and TV shows and these kinds of things focus so much on the, the scare factor. Right. Um, in, in my case, um, I'm really, I consider myself to be more of an ethno-historian, so someone who's interested in paranormal history mm-hmm. and the historical elements and the folklore behind par- paranormal activities or paranormal um, uh, phenomena, those sorts of things. So mm-hmm. I'm not quite as interested in proving whether something exists or not. I'm more interested in finding out why people have come to talk about a particular thing or why they why they have uh, developed a particular worldview about particular activities or events. Oh, well, that's really interesting. So you're not um, a ghost chaser yourself? No, um, I, I keep an open mind about those sorts of things, but I, um, as, as I mentioned, I have a science background, so mm-hmm. I tend to be a little more uh, desirous of having some, some evidence for things. But... Um, but you know, I think, you know, as, as humans, we're all very interested in, in folklore. Even as kids, we learn about um, uh, about things through storytelling. And I find that um, that paranormal um, ghost stories and, and things about um, unexplained phenomena tend to um, have a have a, a background or have a backstory that that is actually quite um, quite complicated and, and actually quite interesting to study just on its own. So, have you had a close encounter yourself? <laughs> um, the one, the one area in this book that I, I tend to be a little more um, uh, willing to sort of discuss my own experiences is in the area of, of kind of UFO experiences. Mm-hmm. Um, as a as a young person, um, I had one of my first jobs was to travel across the uh, some of the Midwestern states um, as a I was a sales representative and. I used to do a lot of nighttime driving where I would drive across Nebraska or, or Iowa or Kansas, and, and there was a lot of driving on very straight roads with not a lot of um, towns or, or even uh, light uh, to, to distract me. And I have to say that I, I did see some unusual things in the sky during some of those drives, um, which made me, to this day, uh, you know, sort of take take a step back and think about whether... Uh, some of those things might have uh, might have been something more than just a uh, just an airplane. That's fascinating. So, do you have a SETI at home set up on your computer? <laughs> um, I actually do. Um, it's ah. it's a very it be, and because it's um, it's something that the University of California Berkeley. Uh, for your listeners who, who may not know yes. uh, about that, that's the um, that's the. Uh, it's a an activity that was um, that was kind of developed out of the University of California to produce a computer program that would allow uh, analysis of, of radio telescope data. And there's so much radio telescope data that's being collected by the university that um, it's very difficult to find the time to analyze all of it. And so they worked out a, um, uh, it's a, a screensaver program that you can download that allows uh, people with their personal computers to help analyze using their computing power at home to help analyze some of the radio telescope data to search for uh, what might be radio broadcasts from other planets or from from deep space. So do they tell you what to look for? Um, No, I mean, you're not, you're actually in in this situation, you're not actually looking for the materials yourself. You're just helping the computers in California amplify the information and, and, and work through the data. So you can see the data being analyzed, and they have a, a kind of an interesting um, program that, uh, uh, that that runs when your your computer isn't working on something else. And uh, uh, 
it goes through and, and analyzes the data that is coming directly from the radio telescopes uh, that they're monitoring. So, um, so it's more of a passive thing from the from the user standpoint, but you're adding to the supercomputing ac activities that California is, is using to do this work. Oh, that's fascinating. How fun. Okay, so are you a member of the Ghost Club? The Ghost Club is the, is an organization that's based in the United Kingdom that uh, studies uh, ghosts and ghost phenomena. So right. um, I, I am not. Um, that's one of the things on my list that I hope to do someday. I'd like to actually visit their um, their site, uh, their club in in, in uh, London. Mm -hmm. uh, but I have so I haven't yet done that. No, I, it's, but it is, it is something that uh, one of these days I would like to, to do. Yeah, that sounds really fun. Now another thing I I caught here when you were talking about Mothman you mentioned something about the men in black that's not too nice <laughs> well I think I think many of us are familiar with the uh, uh, the men in black uh, movies that have that have come out in the last uh, couple of decades uh, right. the popular movies um, but that actually has a um, historical uh, uh, precedent which was, an event that happened in in West Virginia back in the 1960s in a uh, in a small town um, that involved this creature called the Mothman, which was a um, a, a, a flying uh, unexplained flying beast that was seen in this small town, and um, there were many people that saw it. And right around the same time of these sightings, there were the sightings of these mysterious. Um, men in black they were they became to be called and they were uh, visitors to the town that didn't belong there no one knew who they were but they uh, were very dressed very well drove sort of dark mysterious cars and um, interviewed people in the town that had seen this this mothman creature and so um, there is a museum in this town in West Virginia um, which is dedicated to uh, preserving some of the information from those uh, those activities and those that, that whole uh, phenomenon in in the 1960s, and they they still celebrate they celebrate the excitement of this whole thing in parades in this town, and uh, and they have a they have an active kind of uh, uh, popular culture uh, oriented history of that particular particular uh, period. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, they probably have made a novelty of it, just like Roswell, New Mexico. Well, exactly, and I think that's uh, that's one of the interesting things about paranormal activity and, and, and events is that they, they do kind of become uh, their own um, tourist destination right. um, excitement. They help to uh, bring in unexpected benefit, I guess, to having those kinds of things happen is that uh, often people are able to uh, use those things to increase tourism to their area or um, increase the opportunities for people to visit uh, locations that they might otherwise drive right on past. Right. Been very beneficial to that city for sure. Oh, sure. Well, in order to give our readers a taste of this book, can you read us a little bit from it? Our readers, our listeners. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, would, I would be happy to. Um, as I said, the book has uh, a, a wide range of different kinds of uh, experiences and, and uh, destinations and things. Um, some of the uh, destinations are more active than others, and so um, maybe I'll read, since they're all relatively short, I'll read one that uh, involves a destination here in the Four Corners area, the, um, the Monte Vista Hotel, and then I'll read one that's more of, a, um, more of an activity than, than a destination. Great. So let me read the um, the Hotel Monte Vista um, one here. It's, the Hotel Monte Vista is actually number 31 on the list okay. of my 100. It's in Flagstaff, Arizona. And here is my uh, little uh, discussion about its paranormal uh, signature. Okay. Open in 1927, just off historic Route 66, the Hotel Monte Vista in downtown Flagstaff is one of the oldest continuously operated hotels in the southwestern United States. It may also be one of the most ghost-infested, with reports of at least 10 entities haunting specific rooms and the common areas of the building. One of the most interesting is a so-called phantom bellboy who enjoys knocking on guest room doors, announcing room service, and then disappearing. Residing at the Monte Vista while filming nearby, 
legendary actor John Wayne even reported his experience with the, this ghost in the late 1950s. Another spectral highlight is the so-called Meat Man, a long-term resident who died in the hotel and had a bizarre habit of hanging raw meat in his room. Guests subsequently staying in room 220 have reported a number of unsettling occurrences, including being touched in their sleep by unseen hands. Learn more about the paranormal history of the hotel at the hotel website. Mm -hmm. And then you have a photo of it. Yes, and I have a photo of it. And let me, uh, let's see, the other one that might be interesting is um, the history of the Ouija board, which is number 85 on my list. The Ouija board has a really interesting um, history that was very difficult to kind of condense into a into a short entry in this travel book, but, but this uh, short excerpt will give you a, a, and your listeners a sense of it. A product of America's late 19th century fascination with seances in the spirit world, uh, the first commercially manufactured Ouija talking board was released by toy maker in Baltimore during the 1890s. Participants asked questions aloud, and after placing their hands on the game's planchette, they receive a response from ghostly advisors as the pointer moved unassisted to spell out words using the letters and numbers printed on the board. By the early 1970s, the Parker Brothers Company had purchased the rights to mass-produce Ouija boards, and the game quickly became one of the company's most popular releases. Unfortunately, Ouija's many decades of harmless fun took on more sinister connotations with the release of the film The Exorcist in 1973. A key plot point in the movie involves unleashing satanic forces through playing with a Ouija board, and the last half century has seen the game increasingly condemned as a conduit for black magic. Learn more about the history of the Ouija board at the, um, and there's a, a site address for the uh, manufacturer, or for the, the person who actually has the patent for the original Ouija board. And that's one thing that each entry that you have in here has um, not only a place to go for further information, but it's got a photograph with um, lots of credits for that. So you've done your work here. Well, that was that was one of the more difficult um, elements of this. The, um, the, um, the Bucket series of books, the publisher that, that has the series, um, um, and I know that you've had a, 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 at least one other uh, person who's done a book in the series for the publisher. Right. Um, has a certain format to it, and so that's you write to that format. But um, it, each of the four, but to condense the information down into a into a, a kind of summation that that is interesting and makes sense is it requires a lot more research than one might think. <laughs> that's probably harder than writing a few pages on each one. I can imagine. Well, you want to give people uh, enough information to be interested, but not so much information that you think that, they, that they've heard it all and they don't ever need to experience anything themselves. The other challenge, of course, is that you, you want to try and, and have things that not everybody, even the most, uh, the most rabid paranormal uh, fan, has not already done or seen or heard about. So... Um, I, I also mix in some more obscure things. Uh, I've, I've, for example, there's a, a fair amount of literary stuff in here mm -hmm. in this book, um, particularly some authors who people may not necessarily have, have been very exposed to, uh, some older uh, folks from the 19th century and things where um, those, those figures play important roles in the history of not just paranormal stuff, but also in science fiction and other things. And so uh, it's, it's a great opportunity to reintroduce um, or to enhance people's understanding for some of these authors. So how did this all come about? Did you see the opportunity of writing the bucket list and then went and did the research? Or did you have a bunch of research and then saw a place that you could adapt it to? It, um, I think... I think it was really more the uh, the, the the latter of, of the two. I, there was um, I, I've certainly been interested in this material as I mentioned earlier for a long time, and having um, having access to uh, it and reading reading things and reading even reading Edgar Allan Poe and, and stories uh, going way back to to my youth about various things that uh, gives you some vague familiarity with a lot of these things, but you don't really have as deep a rich sense of some of the topics as as you might until you think hey it might be kind of interesting to to produce a travel guide associated with this information and 
uh, the publisher approached me with the idea of doing that, and so it was just a matter of, of using their already established uh, format to uh, incorporate the information and, and to expand it and also to expand my knowledge of some of these uh, activities and events uh, to, to make that work within their format. How long did it take you to put it all together? It took about a year. Yeah. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's not my day job, so uh, right. it's, it's, uh, <laughs> so it uh, is one of those things that you, you do. Um, and, and as I'm sure you know and, and, and your listeners also, I'm sure, know, it's uh, when you write a book, it's something that you have to really be interested in because it gets uh, or can get very, um, uh, very challenging at some points. And, and if you're not really interested in, in seeing it through, it, you, can get, you can get easily distracted and discouraged by the amount of work it takes to do this kind of thing. Absolutely. Your website is really impressive also. Would you talk about that for a minute? Oh, sure. Well, um, my website is, is, is a real work in progress, so it's not, I, I don't have as much time as I'd like to um, update it as often as I want. I'm going to try and work on that a little bit more over the next several months. Um, but it includes, um, it's mostly original content, so it's, it takes some of the issues and, and uh, ideas and, and uh, experiences from the book and expands them out in, in other ways. So it's, I have uh, interviews that I do with um, other authors who are known for their paranormal work or um, even some skeptics and other people who have uh, perspectives on these issues. Um, I go in and look at some original primary source documents from various things and, and uh, kind of review those and present some of that information from the history of, of paranormal things. Um, I do some book reviews. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm just kind of experimenting with a lot of different things. It's kind of it's uh, uh, playing off of the uh, concept of the paranormal bucket list, and making it sort of a bucket of, of activities and, and things. So there's a there's a wide variety of different things and and uh, uh, topics that I cover just just for fun to uh, to keep things interesting. Yeah, it's I love it. It's very well done. Every time I look at it, it's a little different too, something new. So it's definitely dynamic. Well, thanks. You know, today so much of this stuff, uh, particularly the communities that are involved in, in paranormal things, are very active on social media and other things. So you, they, they do kind of expect you to be um, to be out there and engaging with uh, with the community on different different topics and providing um, providing additional perspective on things. So that's uh, that's another challenge that authors deal with today. As as again, I'm sure you you have uh, experienced and, and know is is sort of keeping keeping these communities. Uh, uh, engaged and and uh, working in the in the um, uh, in the world to uh, to increase the visibility of the work you're doing. Absolutely. Tell our listeners the website address. Uh, yes, it's uh, paranormalbucket.com. Okay. Uh, so, uh, just like the book title, and uh, it, I also have my Twitter account, which uh, has some. Uh, Content that, that appears on the website as well as some uh, content that doesn't, which is uh, um, it's at Bucket of Mystery. Okay, great. So here's a question for you. Now I used to be a great fan of the Ghost Hunters, Jay and you know those guys. Sure. What do you think of them? Um, I think they're. I think those uh, not just the Ghost Hunters, but other um, ghost investigators uh, TV shows like that are, are are quite entertaining yes um, I'm often I'm often very uh, very frustrated by the focus on kind of uh, getting immediate results for things so I think that um, mm. as, as somebody who likes the history I find myself wanting more of the history and the sort of how things came to be seen as having a paranormal signature um, I'm less interested in the kind of I don't know the, the the sort of flashlight running through the halls of buildings and, <laughs> right. and screaming about things, but um, but I recognize that it's really good TV. It is good TV, and I always wonder. You know, it always makes you wonder. Well, sure, and that's the that's the fun of this stuff is, is that everybody has their own experience. Um, one of the one of the things um, I, I mention in the book, uh, in the introduction, is that um, that polls that are taken. Today, in uh, in a variety of different places with a variety of different uh, respondents, seem to all indicate that everybody has at least one thing that's a paranormal um, uh, category that they that they actually 
are somewhat comfortable admitting that they might believe in. Right. Um, and it's, it's actually quite interesting when they total up, uh, depend, depending on what topic it is, when they total up the number of people who say they believe in something or they might believe in something, it's around 50% wow. um, for, any, for any particular topic. So I always, uh, events that I do, I always mention to people that um, it's, it's, you know, if you, if you think something is unbelievable, the person next to you probably believes in it. And, and uh, um, I've had that experience, too, where people at, at events have come to me and, sa- and said, oh, you know, I don't believe in ghosts at all, but, you know, but, oh, Bigfoot, now that's a different story. Right. You know, that's a, <laughs> that sort of thing. Yeah, that's interesting. Everybody has their story. So what are you working on now? Well, um, from uh, my next sort of writing project uh, is, is, a, is a very lengthy uh, sort of research project first, and I'm still way in the midst of it. It's uh, a look at the, uh, the rise of the spiritualist movement in the 19th century. Oh, fascinating. In America. And uh, it, it wasn't just in America, it was also in, in, in Europe, but um, I'm focusing mostly on America, and it involves a lot of uh, original research in the archives of uh, a few different uh, collections to uh, read some of the newspapers and other kinds of publications that these places came up with. And you know, it was a very uh, dynamic and quite important movement in the late part of the 19th century and early part of the 20th century um, that uh, that became very fascinated with the afterlife and about how the afterlife might or might not be able to, to give us information about our lives in the in the present world. And so um, a lot of famous writers and, and uh, philosophers and, and uh, public uh, experts did a lot of writing about um, about spiritualism and about these kind of activities. And so I've I haven't exactly figured out what my uh, what my contribution to the the book world is going to be about that period, but it, there's a lot of stuff that um, that I'm going through right now. Well, you seem very adept at at the research and and in the writing, so I think that'll be fun a good project for you. I look forward to seeing that. Yeah, thanks. It's going to be a little more uh, it's going to be a little more uh, history and a little bit less travel oriented, which uh, uh-huh. which makes sense for me but uh, but it was great fun to uh, to do something that like this uh, bucket list book that people can c- just kind of dip in and you know read a, a a piece or two of and then put it, put it aside and dip into it again when they feel like it so there's a picture on your website of you as a child in a magician's costume Yes, that was that was in the 1970s it was it actually um it, it it's partly a mystery because uh I've got uh, as as somebody who has who has uh, other um, activities that I do. I uh, my my book life is somewhat separated from my my day job life, and so I don't. Uh, so I didn't. I, I try not to uh, make it too obvious. Uh, and, and I guess it adds to the mystery of it all. You know what I what I actually do and who I actually am today. Um, but uh, that picture is actually of me. Uh, I think it was probably taken around Halloween. It's actually me dressed up as a as a vampire. Oh, a vampire. Okay. <laughs> sure. Black cape. But I yep. but I had you know I had that the top hat and I had it was just something that uh, even back then I was uh, I was playing around with as a as a as a young kid. Yep. Um, it's it was one of my more my more uh, uh, frightening costumes compared to the uh, the normal uh, you know uh, you know being a tiger or being a, exactly. being a, a you know a vagabond of some sort. So. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> but it's fun, and, and I, as I said, I, I enjoy, uh, it, it adds to the, the sort of um, mysterious element to it, which I like, so that's, that's part of my own contribution to the thing. Well, I really enjoyed the book. Um, I found it really fascinating, and I learned a lot, and I, I like watching your website, too. It's very well done. Well, well thanks. I'm going to continue to, uh, to play around with that, and uh, um, I've now... Uh, begun to uh, do some things on Goodreads as well, so I'm going to be Good. having a, um, in the next few weeks, having a, uh, a, a book giveaway and probably doing some reviews and other kinds of things on there to uh, um, let people know what kind of, what books I'm reading and what things I'm doing on there too, so. Sounds great. Um, well, the main thing is just uh, for people to, to have fun with this sort of thing. I think uh, paranormal folklore and beliefs and, and activities, uh, you know, everyone has their own story, and um, and they should enjoy enjoy telling it and hearing about it. 
and uh, just make sure that when you're doing it, you're you're doing it uh, sensibly and safely, because I think people uh, often find themselves in dangerous situations that they don't expect to be in because they uh, they get distracted or they get uh, overly overly ambitious about the kind of things they want to do. So so um, enjoy it, but have fun with it. Sounds great. Well, thank you so much for talking with me today. Well, it's been a pleasure, Tracy. Thank you for having me. Yes. You can reach me at writeon at sanjuancollege.edu. This is KSJE 90.9 FM, Farmington, New Mexico.